Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi. Let's wait Hi. for Pat and Frederick join. Okay. Hello. This is really weird because Ed is technically the host and I don't see him here. I think uh, Zoom is having a split brain at the moment. Um, hi guys, this is my first network service mesh meeting, by the way. Hello and welcome. Okay, so that's been confusing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was thinking that we might have a split brain in Zoom or something. Like, I, it, it, it feels it feels like it because basically, when I went to go start the meeting, um, I started the meeting. I said, "Oh, the host has another meeting in progress." So I said, "Okay, that's a leftover from before." So I killed the meeting, and then I went to try and, um, yeah, and then nobody else could get in because there was another meeting in progress. So I think you and I were probably fighting with each other over starting the meeting or something. Well, that's the funny part is that I logged in under my own account, which does not have access to start this meeting. So I think it's just Zoom having problems. That's entirely possible. Um, I mean, it, it's, it, it turns out that the, the, the kinds of things that Zoom is doing are hard. Um, I, I've, I've chatted with enough engineers who build web conferencing software to know that like, it's, it's a crazy quilt distributed machine. <clears throat> awesome. So. Let me go ahead and stick the link in the chat for folks to go add themselves as attendees. Um, and then I imagine we can probably get going. Um, is someone able to share the agenda? Should I share it? If you would, please, that would be marvelous. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay. You have a very amusing color choice. <laughs> well, it's girly. Hey. <laughs> it, it, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of amusement. So I am here for my postdoctoral uh, studies. So I am putting that here. Uh, if it is. Well, okay. That's fantastic. So I, I just received my PhD and I, my PhD was on SDN confederations, which is using service uh, function chaining for different clusters. Mm -hmm. But that's like academic project. So not like really in application as you guys are doing in network uh, service mesh project. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to do more realistic things like more practical rather than theory. Uh, mm -hmm. so my motivation is just like uh, really have a, a, a solid connections in my mind between Istio, a, NSM, Calico, uh, or mm -hmm. any network interface. It's just not clicking for me like how they communicate at the moment. So I appreciate any information. That's why I am here. Oh, that would be fantastic. Um, so um, a couple quick things. Uh, if you scroll down through the agenda past the, the standing items, there's usually space at the bottom to add agenda items if you would like. Um, and we're, we're sort of a very free floating community. Uh, anybody's welcome to put stuff on the agenda. Uh, occasionally orders get rearranged depending on what's going on. Today we've got a pretty open free form agenda. Um, amusingly, some of our best meetings have started with completely empty agendas. 
Um, so feel free to add anything that you would be interested in there. Also, if you've not discovered our Slack channel on the CNCF uh, Slack page, that there tend to be a lot of people hanging about in Slack. Um, so feel free to ping me or anyone else over on the Slack channels. Um, you know, we tend to be a fairly social community. Um, and so people will generally tend to answer questions and try and get back to you and have conversations, which is often my experience has been um, when I'm confused, the easiest way to get unconfused is to actually talk with people about it. Um, so that's another good resource for you. Yeah, that's a self-reflection I get. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a definitely another good res resource. Um, the other thing is um, we also have pretty good time zone dispersion in the community. So we've got a bunch of folks in Europe um, as well as North America. So wherever your sort of home time zone is. Yeah, I um, am in Turkey. You're in where? Turkey, Turkey. Oh, lovely, excellent. So um, yeah, so there, there are definitely people around. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting area of sort of conversation. Uh, we can definitely get to that as we get down the agenda. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. okay, great, cool. okay. Fantastic. So definitely make sure to add uh, uh, your items to the agenda if you haven't done so already. And as a reminder, please add yourself to the agenda in the attendees list uh, if you haven't done so already. Okay, well, we're running a bit behind. Uh, Zoom was having a little bit of problems, so uh, please bear with us. Uh, hopefully everyone was able to get in. Um, so let's get started. We have the, welcome to the Network Service Mesh meeting. We have this meeting every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. We also have an issues and PR meeting, which occurs right before this meeting um, at 7.30 a.m. Pacific. So um, feel free to join us in there as well. We have a set of recurring events that we join in on. One of them is the CNCF Telecom User Group which is aiming to define uh, CNFs and their conformance. And uh, that occurs every first Monday of the month. Uh, they swap between 8 a.m. and 3 a.m. Pacific. The next one uh, should be this, uh, this, next, uh, this next coming Monday at 3 a.m. Pacific. There is also the CNCF SIG Network Group, which we participate in, which occurs every first and third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, there are links to each of these communities in the meeting notes. Uh, some, some news. We have uh, KubeCon Cloud NativeCon Europe, which is, um, which is coming up. Uh, we have NSMCon, which we still plan to, to run. Uh, there is a rumor going on that a bunch of the conferences of the zero days have been canceled. Uh, we're looking at, because we are, we are community hosted, we are looking at running anyway, uh, even, if, uh, even, if NS, even if KubeCon is, is unable to do any form of official hosting. So we're working through the logistics right now on that, and we'll make sure to have information to, with, all, with all of you as soon as, we, as soon as we have it. We have coming up as well, Open Network and Edge Summit, North America. Uh, we have KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon, North America, uh, with the CFPs still open. The CFPs were supposed to close last Friday, but uh, I had a talk with uh, Priyanka, and uh, she said that they have been extended to I think July 12th. Uh, if you go to the to the register play page for call for paper and you click on the registry, uh, I believe the website was still out of date, but the actual CFP uh, software itself was was updated. So you still have a little bit more time. If you ran out of time, you now have more time, please get something in. Uh, so, um, quick pause. Um, pardon me, could you help me with the pronunciation of your name? Um, I, I want to pronounce it Hale or Hale, but I'm, oh, I'm sure I'm wrong. Hale. Hale? Yeah. Excellent. So if you scroll up in the agenda, Hale, you'll actually find that the, the stuff about the CFP and the events is actually further up the agenda. We've got a bunch of standing agenda items um, about events and, so, and whatnot, and I very much appreciate you trying to help keep notes. That's actually fantastic. 
But, oh, okay, I didn't know. Okay, I'm sorry. I no, no, that's that's, that's fine. Uh, you're, okay. you're you're doing great. You're doing great. Um, so excellent. Anyway, back back to you, Frederick. No worries. Um, I was not looking at the screen share, so thank you for pointing that out. So I was Cassandra, and uh, thank you, Halle, for helping us out here. Oh, uh, thanks. So, so we have uh, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, North America. Get your get get your uh, uh, presentations in, and we are we are also looking towards a NSM North America event. Uh, we'll have more information on that as uh, as things solidify, as to if and uh, how we're going to do that. Um, we also have um, so no, we don't have any major announcements. Uh, we have. In social media, uh, we have, um, we're, we're following two additional people. We've sent out 28 tweets, uh, include, including information about the CNCF webinar and a variety of events. Um, Event-wise, the Open Source Summit started yesterday. And uh, so if, I believe the cost, I, I think they're still taking registrations if you want to join in. I believe the cost is $50 US. And so it, there's a lot of really great items on the agenda. So uh, it's a very generic conference, but there's a lot of fantastic speakers. And so I definitely recommend uh, looking through the agenda and seeing if uh, things presented there are useful to you. And just for note, the, this, this price drop is typically, if you will join in as a hobbyist uh, without a company, then it's 275 when it's in person. And if you're joining in as a company, the early bird price is 800 up to 1200 for registering right before. So significant uh, decrease in cost in order, to, uh, in order to ensure people can gain access to the content uh, from the virtual side. So uh, the, but the content is absolutely fantastic. So uh, definitely consider, consider joining in. We have, uh, we also posted some information on some trainings. Uh, including uh, Beginner's Guide to Kernel Development and uh, mm -hmm. uh, 500 Lyft scholarships mm -hmm. and uh, some LFAI training. Um, we've also posted a series of, uh, of blogs and, um, and information about the graduation of Project Harbor. Uh, we so also one, post all of- One quick moment. Hello, I think if you scroll down, we're currently in the social media update section. So oh. in the subsection about trainings. Excellent, oh. thank you. Fantastic. And uh, we've also posted the same information on LinkedIn. So feel free to follow us there and you'll get the screen there as well. Um, and so in terms of the, in terms of our plan, we intend to, to send more information on NSMCon EU as we, as we get the final details on it. Um, mm -hmm. And so let's go to the main agenda. So top on the agenda, Istio and NSM, and how do they communicate? Uh, Ed, do you want to take this or should I give it a first shot? Um, I mean, I, I, I can take some of this. Um, so we, we, I did provide you a link. There was actually a talk at EdisonCon North America that was done uh, where somebody had basically done some preliminary integration between Istio and Network Service Mesh. Could I quickly just click on it? Sure. Yeah. I this and this, this, the nice thing about this link is it shows you sort of like not only the talk and its abstract and its speakers, but there are links to the PowerPoint slides um, and the video as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So we, we, I, 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 we try to provide all that in one place. If, if memory serves, essentially, there, there's, there was not a lot of linkage um, between Istio and Network Service Mesh. For the most part, um, Istio, Network Service Mesh handles layer two and three and Istio handles four through seven. Um, but what they were doing is they were running a service mesh that was not bound to a particular cluster, right? So it was a, it was a, it was a Istio service mesh that was smeared across a network service mesh virtual layer three that was multi-cloud. So you had a single Istio instance um, running across multiple clouds. And I think that the one thing they had to do with Istio to make that work was they had to, um, basically change how things get registered in Istio 
because if you run it in a single cluster, Istio registers endpoints using the labels from the pod. Oh, um, let me take a note of this because I will forget. Uh, so that's that's perfectly fine. I mean, good notes are good notes, and and we appreciate you taking them on the agenda. Anything that connects them, uh, knowing that, it will save me tons in my research. Okay, Istio. Yeah. So basically, um, and, and, I, and if you ping me on, on Slack, I'm happy to put you in charge of the in touch with the guys who actually did this demo, um, okay. who would love to talk to you, I'm sure. Um, but I, if memory serves, you know how Istio um, has every endpoint with labels attached to it, correct? Yes. And when you run inside a single cluster, uh, it gets those labels from the labels on the pod. Mm -hmm. um, when you run a network service mesh, I think it. I think the way he had done it, it's getting those labels from the connection request that network service mesh makes, because the pod labels that you have are only necessarily meaningful within the context of your cluster. Whereas sure. if you're running across multiple clusters, you need a set of labels that are going to be meaningful to the clusters you're dealing with, oh. and that's essentially. So they wrote, I think, a little thing that handled that registration there. But I think all that code is actually out there in the open source. So you could go and look and see what they did. Okay, so you're saying Istio uh, should have unit labels among the uh, all the clusters, or should it have like a label encapsulation, some sort of? Well, so here's the interesting thing. Um, we're you know, and, and this should be exciting to you coming from from the research side. Um, a lot of the stuff that network service mesh enables. Um, can be done in a bunch of different ways. Uh, and we don't necessarily know which way is best. So I can tell you what, what, I, what, I, you know, what I think they did, and you'd have to go check, but it doesn't mean it's the right answer. It just means it's an answer, right? And so I think what they did is whenever a, a workload connects to a network service, a network service mesh, its request to connect contains a set of labels. We sometimes call these source labels. And I believe that it was using those source labels um, to register with Istio when you got up to layer several, several, seven services. And, and part of the reason that this is useful is you could imagine a situation where a single pod may want to connect to multiple um, mutually ignorant Istio clusters. And it may want to represent different labels to different Istio clusters or Istio uh, instances. I see. Who should I talk to? Can I put the contact name here? Uh, ping me on Slack. I'll, I'll literally start up a conversation with, with us on Slack. Um, and it will get you connection to all those resources and things. This is actually an area I'm super excited about because in addition to, if you're interested in rolling up your sleeves to do um, some actual work in the community on this, in addition to sort of the, the demo that was done back in November, uh, we've sort of been talking about, and I can provide you pointers as well, some ideas for uh, making that even cleaner um, than what was done in that demo and also more flexible in the sense that uh, what was done in the demo you could only connect a pod to a single istio instance and where we would like to go you could imagine having a pod connected to multiple istio instances and to give you an example of where that would be useful uh, imagine that you've got a major manufacturer like general motors right gm and they have a istio instance that they run for their partner network where they can communicate with all their partners and their partners can communicate with them um, and they're, of course, the ones who administer that. And I'm a manufacturing partner for GM, say AC Delco. I make parts for them. And so I have workloads that I want to be able to connect to GM's Istio instance. But I'd also like those workloads to be able to connect to my Istio instance to communicate with my internal processes. And so right now, the way that Istio handles multi-cluster, that, that's literally not a, that, that's not a very easily, easy thing to even conceptualize. And with network service mesh, it's very easy to conceptualize. They're two distinct network services, both of which have Istio running on top of them. Mm. It's like, uh, yeah, it is like if we consider NSM like a physical layer, Istio is like kind of a VPN, like something virtu virtual. Uh, I, I, I would think of it more this way. So you're absolutely the right direction in terms of thinking about things in terms of layers. Um, so it literally is, it's back to the good old fashioned OSI model. You think of Istio as handling layers four through seven and network service mesh is handling layers, you know, mostly layer three. Um, we, we, we talk occasionally about the fact that we can handle layer two payloads, but it turns out that usually that's not a good idea 
uh, but there are definitely cases where it is. Usually you just want to care about layer three, but we can handle layer two. Um, but if you've ever had the misfortune of trying to smear a VLAN across a WAN, it, it, it's really not a happy experience. Um, but anyway, so you can think of Istio as handling layers four through seven. So if you think about the way Istio runs normally on top of a Kubernetes cluster, mm -hmm. it's running on top of the Kubernetes clusters layer three, right? And so it's running on top of a single static network service, which is the Kubernetes uh, layer three. And that's fine. It just happens to be attached completely to the cluster. So you've well, we, we refer to this as welding your connectivity domain to your runtime domain. And that's sort of how we, people have done things traditionally. And network service mesh lets you divorce that. So now I can say, rather than running Istio on top of the layer three for my cluster, I can run Istio on top of a virtual layer three. Um, you can think of it as a VRF or a VPN, if you're used to those networking terms. Mm -hmm. That's actually smeared around among workloads that may be running all kinds of places. They may be workloads running in different clusters. They may be workloads that are running on VMs. They may be workloads that are running on physical on-prem yeah. systems. Uh, I was uh, going through this PDF, like how it shows uh, mm -hmm. defining network service mesh to a developer. Um, and I really liked it. And the way it defines like where uh, it is currently and where it is destined to reminds mm -hmm. me like service function chain. <laughs> yes, yes. So the, the you've probably seen things like Sarah's story in some of our collateral. Yeah, that's that one. Exactly, Sarah's story. Like it's it, okay. So I get this one and then I will forward to here kind of. No, it, uh, it's 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 very much, you, you could, it's definitely very familiar if you come from a background where service function chaining is something you're accustomed to. So one of the interesting things we've dealt with is that we've got people coming from the cloud native side and people coming from the network side, all of whom are interacting in this community. And so there are a bunch of terms- I don't know where I am coming from. I just want to understand <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so and we, have, we have a bunch of, of terms that are coming from the network side like service function chaining um, we will typically talk about that uh, in terms of, of network service composition um, mm -hmm. rather than, than service function chaining, partially because we can do a thing that um, we can we can do a thing where the inter the various components don't have to know what who's next in the chain, um, which is very, very, very convenient. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's definitely it's very spiritually similar in the case that you can build graphs of things that are providing parts of your network service. Yes. Um. Yeah, from a uh, community perspective, um, we, in our literature, we, we tend to stay away from the term service function chaining primarily because in, when you're going to speak with people who, who work on enterprise networks, uh, that's not a term that uh, that they tend to gravitate towards. Uh, for them, there's a lot of complexity there because uh, historically, when you're bringing in SDNs that are designed to do service function chaining and you try to do anything beyond the most basic use cases, it turns into uh, a very complex set of solutions that uh, tie you down to a specific SDN. And uh, we, when we give our presentations, we, we show how you can create these chains, like say, how do you connect your workload to, uh, to a firewall, then an intrusion detection system, then to your VPN. And all the networking people when afterwards, when we talk, will come up to us and say, isn't that just service function chaining? And we say, well, it is service function chaining, but, uh, and then we explain the same thing. <laughs> and so, uh, one good yeah so so that, that's why we tend to, to not use that specific term in the in the literature is uh, it, there there is uh, th we are chaining network functions together we are composing them together um, and composing is more spiritually what we're what we're aiming towards uh, as opposed to just building a out of static chain where we're trying to compose dynamically compose a a service based upon a policy So one other thing that may actually be helpful as you're, as you're looking at this and thinking about this is, um, and, and I, I, so network service mesh itself, the components that we build in network service mesh for the most part, are just constructing the virtual wires that connect workloads to network service endpoints that provide the network services. 
So we definitely build some network service endpoints so we can demonstrate things, but, but mostly network service meshes in the business of virtual wires. And this is a really interesting mind bending shift if you're used to thinking in the traditional SDN sense, because SDN is thinking about how do you program the virtual switches? And there's importance to that as well, but it actually turns out to be much more important to be able to flexibly connect workloads to them um, because that allows you to do a whole bunch of things, right? You no longer have the one true SDN for everything. Now you can connect things to whatever SDN is providing what it is they truly need. Okay, so like, um, okay, SDN has some missing things, Istio has missing things, Kubernetes, all those things. Uh, like, um, I am just listening, uh, you guys saying, mm -hmm. uh, please, uh, like, I am, I am thankful you're being patient with me. Um, mm -hmm. I, in, in every meeting, I will understand more. Uh, this is exactly how humans work. <laughs> like right now I am just hearing things and trying to understand uh, by comparing to my previous knowledge and uh, um, hopefully uh, after a couple of weeks like I will I will understand and when I understand more maybe I can be a contributor who knows that would be fantastic um, I mean there, there's a lot of material on there's a bunch of talks on YouTube by the way Mm -hmm. um and uh, they're, they're also uh, we have an entire folder full of collateral in terms of slide decks and documents that that we can also point you to that's yeah, publicly you, visible you told me to ping you after this but how do i ping you you uh, i don't know like, are, are you on the cncf slack no okay so hang on um let me let me sort of give you the, the best jumping off point for all of this um, yeah, my email is right up there in, in attendance. So yep. you can, okay. So here, I'm going to put a link in the chat. So this is the link in the chat. Um, and if you look at it, there's a, a communications channel section okay. that is down at, the, down at the bottom of that page. Mm -hmm. And um, in there, there are links to get to the Pound NSM channel on Slack and how to actually get on the CNCF Slack. So there is also a link on the uh, in the agenda on the uh, on the top. So in the mm -hmm. meeting notes uh, that has the details of the of the NSM meeting on the last line is uh, a line that says join CNCF Slack and there's a get invitation link. Yep. <clears throat> but that's a that's a good place to jump off because you're asking you're asking a lot of really good questions um, and they're interesting well, questions. I've got all these uh, lined up. I'll be so happy. By the way, mm -hmm. I am uh, ex-Googler, like former Googler, uh, mm -hmm. worked on uh, Jupyter SDN, before SDN for seven years. Between oh, fantastic. And 2017. Like I was in architect and SDN controller from scratch, mm -hmm. uh, but that's limited to just closed fabric. I, I am not so familiar with cloud, uh, mm -hmm. but now uh, I am interested because you know 5G is going towards this, and I see that NSM will play a big role in 5G because mm -hmm. it has uh, it provides the flexibility for network slicing at the top. I just mm -hmm. don't know how to connect all those together because uh, because you know I haven't find out those answers. Yeah, no, that 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 that's actually super exciting uh, because um, that you've got the the background the, the deep background of having built really working SDNs um, because it, it it turns out the combination of those two skills the ability to both reason about networks and the ability to actually program um, that's an unusual skill set. Um, I've I've often worked with. Uh, a variety, I, I did a lot of stuff with open daylight um, and SDN controllers and that kind of stuff there. And, and finding people who can both write good code and actually think deeply about networks is relatively unusual. Right, and uh, for, uh, for uh, 5G to work end to end, uh, Onos has to be there. And I am curious how ONAP will talk to Onos when having NSM underneath. Well, I mean, Onos is just one choice of controllers. Um, you've got a bunch of people making a bunch of different choices about controllers out there. Um, so, for example, I know uh, ONAP tends to use Open Daylight for a lot of things um, okay. currently. 
Well, Olaf so says the uh, best one for tenant purposes, tenant SDN. Uh, uh, so again, it, it, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of things happening there. Network service mesh, the, the big thing with network service mesh is we're actually pretty agnostic. Um, <laughs> we really don't care what SDN you choose because people have strong opinions. All we do is provide you the virtual wires to connect you to whatever the network service is. I see. That, that's why it is the best way to have the standards, which means agnostic, yeah. Well, it, it turns out, like, you, you've dealt with enough SDN to realize that there, once you get up to layer two, there's a nearly infinite number of features that people may want, and they fight about them, and you can't have them all at once. And so um, there are a bunch of choices, and so you get a lot of different options that people put together once you get to layer two and layer three. Um, but it turns out at layer at virtual layer one, where the contract of a wire is you push a packet in one side and it comes out the other, um, there's just not that much space to argue. Um, right. And that ends up being very positive for us. Right, right, okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and uh, in fact, since you have experience with, uh, with Juniper, uh, I'm actually uh, having a series of conversations Sorry, it, not Juniper. It is Jupiter. Jupiter. Oh, Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter ah. is the biggest cl uh, cloth fabric from Google. Jupiter. Ah, I get it. I just heard. I apologize. Um, yeah. So in in terms of um, um, so in terms of SDN integrations, I mean, like if you're looking to get more involved uh, with any particular area, just uh, you know, as as you start to look at things, just uh, let us know what your interests are and we'll try pointing you in the right direction or connecting you to the right people to, to get better informed. And that goes for everyone who's in the community as well. So anyone who Thank wants to, to take, uh, follow a similar path. Thank you. So, um, let's see. Is there, do you have any other questions along this or? Uh... So for the uh, first one for this, uh, what I want to do is I will take these notes, go back and read, study and look more. And uh, then maybe next week I'll review with you guys that so you can lead me better. And uh, yeah, we can move to the next one. Yeah, so you were asking about how we interact with, Cal we, can we interact with Calico? Yeah. Um, and, and the answer is we don't. So oh. one of the things we realized very, very, very early on, so most of the things that people were trying to do to provide additional networking in Kubernetes involved, they would go and they would build their magic S, uh, CNI plugin that did whatever the thing was. Uh -huh. uh, and, and a couple of things would happen. Number one, most of the time people didn't want to install your magic uh, CNI plugin. They wanted to use whatever CNI plugin they wanted to use. And the other thing that happened was that it turns out that the, the contract of Kubernetes networking is actually remarkably constrained. The number of useful things that you can do beyond what the contract defines before you start breaking Kubernetes networking contract is actually relatively limited and not particularly interesting. Um, and so we, we realized that the problem was not to try and go and smash more stuff into CNI. The problem was to how to coexist with it in a mutually ignorant way. Um, and I, I will use the word mutually ignorant often because it's actually really important. So Calico has no awareness that network service mesh exists. Network service mesh neither knows nor cares what your CNI plugin is. Um, what network service mesh actually does is it takes a great deal of care to make sure that whatever it is doing to drop those V wires into your pod and to make sure that traffic is routed to them, that we don't collide with the existing prefixes for your cluster. And, and this, this non-collision principle, this exclude for, uh, prefixes approach, what it means at the end of the day is that if I'm in a pod and I go try and reach a Kubernetes service, um, I'm going to get routed into the thing that's being provided by my CNI plugin. Why? Because none of the network services I'm talking to are overlapping or colliding with the service kitter or the pod kitters for my cluster. Does that make sense? Uh... No, but not in sense that I argue with you. Uh, okay, go ahead. I just need to uh, um, 
can you give me document to read so I see that it is not colliding with let me let me find you really quickly because I actually do have I'm pretty sure I have a slide deck that has precisely talking about the exclude stuff so I could probably give you a link to a particular slide yeah I know that slide it is on YouTube as well it is talking about what the problem is not solving about what the problem I'm sorry uh, the problem is not uh, what what is in the scope and what is not in the scope Ah, uh, yes. And so the, 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 the real question I think you have is how do you avoid overlapping and colliding with what CNI, what your CNI plugin is doing, right? Okay, but um, so they don't communicate. Okay, they don't communicate. I hope I will understand uh, mm -hmm. by next week how they don't communicate. And if not, uh, go ahead and as I said, ping on Slack and more pointers can be provided. Um, okay, yeah, as I said, every week it will be clearer for me mm -hmm. and sorry for asking stupid questions. <laughs> there are no stupid questions. So here's the thing, and this is particularly true from the networking side. Um, network Service Mesh thinks about networking in a very cloud native way, and it's very new to networking people. Um, and our experience has generally been that uh, it's a little bit strange when you start out because we are actually thinking about networking in a very different way. Um, but people tend to get very excited once it starts sinking in because it opens up an entire world of possibility. So for example, um, you, you've worked with this Jupyter controller on the, the internal Google Fabric. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that ends up being true is that typically speaking on any given fabric, you have precisely one controller that's allowed to control it, correct? Mm -hmm. And that actually produces certain kinds of constraints because if I need something new on that fabric, I have to go find a way to get it into the one true controller and I have to find a way to get it to not interact negatively with the other features being provided by the one true controller. And the complexity of this problem gets very, very, very large, very fast. Okay. The way that network service meshes approach the problem, because you can connect to multiple network services and think of a network service as a fabric. Um, if I don't have to make those network services very complicated as a result because they don't have to meet everybody's needs. They just have to meet the needs of the particular workloads that are connecting to them. I and if see. I have a Okay, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and this ends up being super powerful because, so for example, like people will put a lot of energy into the moral equivalent of access control lists in order to, connect, to control connectivity, who, what workloads can communicate with work, what workloads. Um, network service meshes, uh, version of, of how you would address this usually consists of, uh, well, why don't you just create a virtual layer three and then only let the workloads that should be talking on that virtual layer three for that thematic purpose connect to it. So if I create a database replication network service, then only allow the databases that need to replicate to connect to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I, I saw you had a last question about SSC and NSH. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have fond memories of NSH. I actually know a lot of the guys who standardized that at the IETF. For those folks who are cloud folks and not network folks, NSH stands for network service header. And it was yeah. an IETF standard for allowing you to include metadata along with your packets that could be used by a service function chain, including that metadata in line. And so network service mesh is very agnostic about what we refer to as remote mechanisms, meaning you can think of it as we really don't care what kind of headers you want to shove into the packet to indicate what vWire it's on. Uh, we'll let that be negotiated with who, whatever is providing the network service. Um, we don't currently support NSH, but mechanically there's no reason we couldn't support it because again, we're, we're very agnostic on the principle. Does that make sense? Okay, at least I know that there's no correlation. Uh, it will slowly sink in. I need to... Uh, That's okay. Yeah. I think uh, I want to run all these in a simulator, not a simulator environment. I think I need to buy something in cloud. And I want to run these like a, mm -hmm. like a poke for a telco or for a real use case. 
-hmm. And so experiment we... and uh, capture the packages and see uh, just like I need a playground if you can guide mm -hmm. me. Yeah, so we do have um, we, we do have instructions on the, the website that will point you to our home uh, home tricks. And um, network service mesh, if you, for the basic kicking the tires, it runs fine in Kai. So you could even run it locally on your laptop. Um, but we also, our CI runs across uh, GKE, AKS, and EKS, as well as vanilla Kubernetes on bare metal at packet.net. So mm -hmm. we know we run in those environments. We also have folks in the community who are working on getting it running on OpenShift, um, which is exciting. Um, and if you're sort of interested in real telco environments, um, when you ping me on Slack, I can also loop in. There are some folks at some telcos who are doing some work with NSM as well um, okay. and doing some proofs of concept. Um, and they're sort of straddling between, you know, being in, internal and open source. And so they probably would love to talk to you as well. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, great. Cool. So that was fun. Um, is there anything else that folks have for the agenda today? I, so, now. I have enough to read. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one thing, if, if anyone's also looking for things to do, we can always use uh, more and uh, easy, more easily approachable documentation on this stuff. Um, and so, uh, so if you're looking for something to, to contribute towards, uh, that's an easy way to, to get started. Yes, definitely. Well, thanks for letting me to present. It felt like I am part of this. You're, you're, you're definitely very welcome. I, I, I'm, I'm super interested in, me because we, we all learned so much from the SDN experience. I, I'm really, really pleased to have people who have some of that learning. Um, you know, more, the more of those people involved, the better. And so, you know, we're, we're delighted to have you here. And, um, you know, it, 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 and it's good that you're also looking in terms of sort of like spanning the academic research with more of the, the stuff that's happening in the real world. I think the more of that that happens, the better it is for everyone. Oh, thank you. My ICCE paper will be uh, published about the Vendor Independent uh, ACN Confederation. Uh, You're getting very it, faint. It is like, um, it is about uh, how uh, service function chains work with different uh, clusters, but clusters in terms of different group of hardwares, like when uh, uh, telcos or other people who are using SDN, uh, mm -hmm. when they do a migration, uh, they end up having different sets of clusters with different capabilities. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of for that. Uh, so I'll let you know when it's published. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Great. So is there anything else that uh, anyone would like to speak about? We have about 10 minutes. Otherwise, we'll yield back some time. Okay, I will uh, take the assumption that uh, there are no other topics on the agenda. So I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, uh, again, we will have more information on NSMCOM as it, uh, as it solidifies. The, the plan at this point is to continue forward with it. And uh, thank you all, and we'll see you all at the same time next week. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.